Time flies by. Seems like yesterday when we were talking about Cinema 4D Release 20, but a year has already passed. By now you know the drill, so let's talk about R21. But before we do, I need to take care of my audience retention rate. So here's an explosion. There are a lot of nice features in R21, but I think the one that will have the most impact is the fact that now Cinema 4D comes in one flavor. So no visualize, broadcast, studio, etc. Everyone has the same version with all features enabled. No need to figure out which version suits your needs or worrying that other people you collaborate with won't be able to open your files. Everyone has the same version and it's the equivalent of the studio version in previous releases. Now. Let's get to the meat of it. Let's start with a more design-oriented feature, and that's caps and bevels. If you're a designer, chances are you're very particular about typography and how it looks, and especially in 3D where the form is described in a lot more detail. In previous releases, the options for caps were somewhat limited, so we would usually end up with something like this. Not bad, but it could be much better. Now with the release 21, we have a lot more options and the results are so much better. We can get all of these effects with just a couple of options. The bevel shape is where all the magic happens. We can have the regular extruded text with a bit of rounding. But as you can see here, we also now have a drop down with more options to choose from. So now we can create a chisel type of text or a stepping effect. We also have the ability to manually create the profile we want by adjusting this curve here. Of course, the caps and bevels are not limited to text. They are available in other areas supporting caps, for example, in the extrude object. Overall, it's a flexible system that will help artists get exactly the result they had in mind. Now, let's move on to another nice addition to R21, Field Forces. Field Forces like Volumes and MoGraph is the type of feature you can play with for hours on end. With Field Forces we can basically influence the movement of particles and any other object using dynamics. By dragging fields and objects inside the Field Force object, we can control how the Field Force will behave. Let's start with something simple. We have this cube here with a rigid body tag and now I'm going to add a Field Force object. On its own, it's not going to do anything, so if I press play, the cube goes right through it. So I'll add a linear field to the field force. I'm not a fan of the default visualization, so I'm going to switch it to brightness. In my opinion, it's a more clear indication of what the field force is doing. I'll also reduce the line density a little bit. So what this tells us is that we have a force that will move an object from right to left. Let's give it a try. I'll hit play, and as you can see, the object goes from right to left. The important thing to note here is that the field force is unlimited, so it's not restricted to the dimensions of the linear field. If we want to have that behavior, we need to create a mask and contain it there. So I'm going to add a mask, and then create a box field, and use that as the masking object. If I hit play, we can see that the cube's movement is not influenced at all, but once it crosses that bounding box, it starts to move from right to left. These simple principles can be used to create more complex effects. In this example, particles are running through a surface with the help of field forces. Lots of fun to be had here, but we have more things to show, so let's move on to the next feature, denoising. If you've watched one of my older videos about denoising renders in Photoshop, you know how big of an effect a process like that can have on your final renders. You can go from a super noisy render to a clean one in no time at all. With R21, we have the option of denoising right there within the app without having to jump into Photoshop. We just enable the option in render settings and that's it. Now once the render is finished, the denoising will be applied. This is the kind of results you can get from Cinema's denoiser. Of course, the more we let the render clean up, the better the denoise result will be. But we can get some nice clean results even from super short renders. I can see this being very helpful when you're tight in time and you want to show a client some final quality renders but without the long render times. 
If you want a bit more control, I would encourage you to watch my previous video, but Cinema's one-click setup is absolutely perfect and without requiring an external application. Now, let's move on to the next feature. If you're into character animation, you will definitely love this. R21 comes with a Mixamo control rig, which allows for super easy manipulation of an imported Mixamo animation. The process is quite simple, and with just a couple of clicks, we can transfer the animation to the custom Mixamo rig. Then we're free to adjust the animation to our liking. Now let's uh, switch it up and talk about materials. In R21, nodal materials get a serious boost with the addition of AOVs. Think of AOVs as a turbocharged version of the multipass system already available in cinema. AOVs allow us to get a pass out of every element that makes our material. Let's take this simple example here. Our material is made out of these three elements. With AOVs, we can get each of these shaders as separate passes so we can fine tune things in post. To set our AOVs, we just go to the Material node, and at the bottom we have the option to add AOVs. Since we have three layers, I will add three AOV channels. We can rename them however we want, and we can also give them a separate ID, so that every shader will end up in its own layer. Now that everything is set up, the only thing left is to go to the Render Settings and enable Multipass Rendering. I will add the RGB Pass, an object buffer for the planet, and finally our three AOVs. And that's it! When the render is finished, we will end up with a document that has the RGB pass and the three AOVs in layers. Now we have the flexibility to adjust the intensity of the materials and fine-tune things to our liking. Now I would like to highlight a workflow improvement that might seem small, but makes a huge difference when working with high-density objects. Before, if we were building a complex model using VDBs, we could get into a scenario where things were calculating slowly. Either because we're producing a really high dense mesh, or because we're using multiple filters, or of course a combination of both. In R21, we can speed things up and continue working on our complex model just by adding a cache layer. Whatever is underneath that layer will be cached, so the system won't keep calculating unnecessary things. That way, we can keep editing our object without having to wait for the system to catch up. Another cool thing we can do with volumes, and this is something that will interest more people, is the fact that we can now render gaseous objects, like clouds, fire, etc. This requires ProRender, but it's very simple to set up. First off, we need a volume. When we import one, we just need to define the density, adjust the value range, and finally apply a material. The material is applied through a volume tag, so once we have that assigned, we can then create a volume material and apply that to the tag. And just like that, we have the ability to render super realistic volumes. If we render something else other than clouds, like an explosion for example, we need to set up things a little bit differently, but it's still super simple to do. As you can see here, we have three sets of volumes, which we can enable and disable according to our liking. We also have the option to choose all of them, or one of them to color the volume. So in the volume tag, I'm using this one for coloring, and in the volume material, I've adjusted the colors to look more like how a cloud of smoke and flames would look like. And that's all there is to it. I've spent way more time playing with this feature than I would like to admit, but as you can see, you can have lots of fun with it. Of course, we can create our own volumes if we want to. For example, we can have this bit of text look like a puffy cloud just by switching the volume builder to fog mode and randomizing how the volume looks with the use of a random field. I'm only using the volume measure here to help me visualize the final result in the viewport. The volume measure is not required at all when rendering fog volumes. Of course, a new cinema release wouldn't be complete without an update to the Condor browser, and as with previous releases, it's quite substantial. 
The most immediate change is the complete reorganization of the libraries. Now the assets are not bound to a specific Cinema 4D version, so it's easier to find the assets you're looking for. There's some beautiful stuff in here. Great looking and detailed objects with super clean geometry, textures to weather your material, of course materials of all kinds, camera presets, example scenes, you name it. It's an indispensable resource for any C4D artist. But apart from all the bigger features, there are a ton of small adjustments throughout cinema. The most obvious one is the switch to a darker color scheme that is friendlier to our eyes along with several cosmetic changes like uh, alignment of elements, redesign of some of the icons, and so on and so forth. For OS X users, the interface now follows the OS's guidelines a little bit closer, but without sacrificing functionality. This is one of my absolute favorites. So now the menu is at the top like in all other applications, but the functionality of the, the Cinema 4D menus is still there. So we can still tear away the menus like we're used to. At the same time, we gain some useful OS specific functions. For example, using OS X's menu search function to find a command. But if you're not comfortable with that change, you can always revert back to the previous behavior of having the menu being part of the Cinema 4D window. But it's not only OS X that benefits from these changes. Now, Cinema 4D for PCs, for example, supports high res displays. Using this version of Cinema makes it harder to go back to an older version. The older versions now look like an uglier sibling. But apart from that, there are a ton of other small adjustments. For example, the tags are now more organized. The colors of the lights are now reflected on the icon, which makes scenes much more readable. Objects can now use custom icons, and a whole lot more. All these little things could be a whole video on their own. There are other honorable mentions, like a more robust asset manager that now keeps track of a lot more things than before, but let's wrap things up for this video. If you have any questions, feel free to post them in the comments below and I'll do my best to answer them. Take care and I'll see you on the next one.